All right. In this part of applied linear structures for computing, we are going to talk about clustering. Specifically, I want to talk about k-means clustering so that you can see how representing information in terms of vectors and linear structure in general can help in data analytics. You will see a lot of further clustering and data analytic algorithms in the future courses, but this is just to give you an idea of how linear algebra and linear structure are useful for data analytics. All right, let's start with the objectives. First, we'll talk about the goals of clustering, what are the applications, and an introduction to k-means cluster. So uh, given a set of points like this, so these are data points. This could be any real world data collection. It could be patient's information in a hospital. It could be the data about vehicles which are driving in transportation network and so on. We want to categorize these data points into groups. Or in other words, we want to cluster them. We want the points which are in the same group to be close to, uh, to one another in terms of feature, in terms of characteristics, and sometimes even in terms of the geographical location. For example, you have some cars on the streets. And what you want to do, you want to cluster the cars which are closest together. For example, here we can have three clusters. And after we categorize them, what we want to do, we want to have we want to have some number of clusters that represent the classification of our data. All right. What are the applications of clustering? The first application that as computer scientists and information theorists, we, info, uh, information technologies we will deal with is topic discovery and document classification. X sub i is word count histogram for document i. So you have a set of documents and you want to classify them. So you can have the word count histogram for different words and try to cluster them. The second one is for healthcare, patient clustering, where data points or X sub i's are patient attributes, test results, and symptoms. So based on this information, you want to cluster your patients. Next application domain is financial sector. In the financial sector, X sub i or our data sets are financial attributes of each of the companies that we are having. And there are some other applications, customer market segmentation or retail and color compression of images. So as you can see, uh, clustering has several applications. Uh, before we get into the k-means algorithm and see how it can help us with clustering or data classification, Let's take a look at uh, measures for uh, measures that can help us to quantify similarity between clusters. So let's say we have two clusters of data, data point one, x sub one, x sub two, x sub three. And we have another cluster here, x sub four, x sub five, and x sub six. All right, so what are different measures to evaluate the similarity of data points in each of these uh, groups or each of these clusters? The first approach is called single linkage. So single linkage refers to the closest point in each cluster. What does that mean in our example? X sub two and X sub four are the closest points. So this is B to four. So single linkage simply finds the closest point in each of these, in the two clusters. The second category is called complete linkage. So what is complete linkage? It refers to the furthest points in the two uh, groups. So in this case, x5 and x sub 3 are the furthest. So this is called D35, called complete linkage. The next one is find all of the pair distances 
between the two clusters, between the two clusters of data, and then find their average. It's called average linkage. Average linkage. So we have to calculate all pairs. So D from X sub one to X sub four, plus D from X sub one to X sub five, plus D from X sub one to X sub six. And we do the same for all of them. Two to four, two to five, two to six, and three to four, three to four, D three to five, and D three to six. And we have nine of them, so divided by nine. This is called average linkage. And finally, another measure could be finding the centroid for each cluster. So let me show the centroid by green. So let's call this C sub one, the centroid for cluster one, and C sub two, the centroid for cluster two. And then uh, simply uh, call it the average group linkage. So average group linkage is the distance between two centroids is D from C sub one to C sub two. So these are different measures to evaluate similarity when we have two clusters. Now I'm going to talk about K-means clustering so that you have an idea of how K-means clustering leverages this uh, similarity. So uh, K-means clustering is going to utilize linear structures. First, I will give you a general idea, then we talk about the algorithm. To fully understand k-means, it's very important to grasp how to take a norm and how to compute the distance between two points. And what are these points? These are our data set, which is represented by vectors. So you can see two places where linear structures play a pivotal role in clustering. One, representing the data in terms of vectors, and two, finding distance and norm between different points. Simply said, norm is being used to compute the distance between a data point and a centroid. So we will have, as we discussed in the previous slide, we will have these clusters that have centroids. And what we want to do, we want to find the distance between each data point, x sub one, x sub two, x sub i and the central. And you will see how we leverage this uh, to find uh, different clusters, to cluster the data. And the distance between two vectors, let's say I have vector x, which is x sub one, x sub two, x sub n, and vector y, which is y sub one, y sub two, and y sub n. How do we find the distance between these two? The square root of the square root of x1 minus y sub 1 square plus x sub 2 minus y sub 2 square plus x sub n minus y sub n square. So this is how we determine the distance. One step closer to understanding k means. Now suppose that we have a set of observations. Each of these observations could be a vector. So we call them x sub i for i from one to n, where x i is a d-dimensional vector, depending on our data set, how many attributes our data set have. For example, when we are talking about weather conditions, each of these data points could include rain, temperature, humidity, and wind state. Chemis clustering tries to assign each vector a group from a set of groups. So we show our groups as S and we have K groups. So basically number of clusters is shown as K. So when we talk about K means clustering, K means K represents the number of groups. And the person or the algorithm which is using K means is defining the number of groups. K means does this uh, clustering by computing the distance between each point and each centroid. And we'll assign that point to the group with its distance is the smallest. 
What does that mean? Let's call this C sub one and C sub two. And we have some data points around here. X sub one, X sub two, X sub three, X sub four. So let me consider a simple example of X four. So first we find X, distance of X four to C two, call it D one. And then we find distance of X one to C one, call it T two. So because D1 is less than D2, then we are going to assign X4 to the cluster where centroid 2 is located. That's why we talk about the distance is smallest or shortest, the shortest path. Once uh, it has all this, the algorithm adjusts each of the centroids by computing the average value for all of the points that belong to that cluster. And then we define the new centroid. So as you can see, this is a, an iterative process. Let's try to represent this in a more uh, systematic way. This is the algorithm. This is the k-means algorithm. We have the initial centroids, c sub 1 to c sub k. So the initial centroids usually are generated randomly. So each centroid should be d-dimensional as your data is. So if our data, data set is d-dimensional, these random centroids, we call them initial points or starting points are also d-dimensional. If this is a little bit confusing now, don't worry. We are going to see a practical example in the next lecture. So all this will be clear. So we repeat this process by updating the partition. Assume that X sub P is a data point. S sub I or group I is defined as X sub P, where the distance from X sub P to C sub I which defines group SI is less than or equal to the distance from X sub P to any other centroid. So this is all centroids. And this is the distance from this specific uh, C sub I. So we have group one, group two, group three. When we start, we have C sub one, C sub two, C sub three. And we try to find the points which are closest to C1 and assign them to the central, to this group. We try to do the same for group two and group three. After we did that, we have to update the central. This is a very important step. How do we do that? So from the previous step, we already determined which points belong to this group, right? Maybe two points are here, four are here, one, two, three, point five, six, maybe uh, seven points are belonging to S3. Now we find the centroid for each of them. Here, we find the new centroid, C sub one, which is the average of the given four points, data points. Here we have two, so the new centroid is the average of these two. And here we have seven, so the average, uh, the average of these seven data sets, data points, is going to give us the new central. All right. And uh, this symbol shows the cardinality of the set or the number of points that are located in each of these groups. As I said, for S sub one, the new centroid is going to be X sub one, X sub two, X sub three, X sub four, divided by four. What is four? Four is the cardinality of uh, this set, uh, this group, group one. For group two, C sub two, let's say X five and X six, these are only two points divided by two. And for group three, X sub seven, X sub eight, X sub nine, X sub 10, X sub 11, so we had seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, X sub 13, divided by seven. So this gives us this new center. We do this process, until the, the convergence of centroids. What does that mean? It means there is a point where uh, your clusters don't change. So if I repeat this one more iteration, 
and none of these points change the location in terms of the group that they are belonging to, then we have converged to our, our goal. The clustering should terminate at that point. All right, so in this lecture, we talked about the applications of clustering. As you could see, it's in, 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 in a lot of computing and engineering domains, right? From document classification to healthcare to uh, retail and so on. Then we talked about why linear algebra is useful and essential to understand and implement cluster. As you could see, we represent the data as vectors. We have to find the distance between data points and we have to use the concepts such as norms. So that's why we have to have this knowledge from linear algebra. And then we talked about the idea of k-means clustering. Finally, we showed the formal representation of k-means algorithm. As you could see, k-means starts with random centroid, C sub one, C sub two, C sub K. Then it finds the distance of all data points to all centroids. Then it assigns data points to groups, each group represented by one of the centroids. Then we update centroids for each group. And this iterative process goes on and on. So we update cent uh, the centroids. This process continues until the convergence has been reached. until centroids do not change, we continue to do this iterative process. In the next lecture, I'm going to show the pictorial or illustrative representation of Chamin's algorithm, just to have an idea of how it works. And then we will solve a hands-on example together to understand the concepts that we talked about in this lecture.